Good morning, Chris. Good morning. You okay, Ninda? I'm absolutely fine. Firstly, thank you for taking out the time. I suppose some people might say it's bright and early to around nine o'clock in the morning. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I've had my cup of tea and I should be having another one after this. But let's get cracking. Um, manufacturing is in the news, wherever we wherever we look, particularly the last 12 to 18 months. Yes. Um, so somebody, Mr. Cugrino, who is imbued into everything manufacturing, um, it'll be nice to have a chat about the following things. I'd like to talk about the potential of onshoring, in other words, bringing more manufacturing. Uh, what is the long-term game, game, you know, for uh, manufacturing? What role is technology such as 5G, robotics and AI going to include? Uh, what will that mean? Um, have we got the skills, long-term, short-term and medium-term? Uh, what role does energy play? And then if we get time, we'll talk about something called the industrial strategy. We'll probably pull it out of the put it out of the memory banks from somewhere and have a look at that. And then, of course, I certainly want to touch on what you went through as somebody who's a typical manufacturer through the recent crisis with COVID and everything. So, so over to you, Chris. Now, I know you as the chief CEO of SDE Technology. What I don't know is what brought you into manufacturing. Let's face it, most people either head off to the city in finance and very few people, and we'll maybe get a chance to talk about perception of manufacturing. What yep. took you then, Chris, into manufacturing? Well, I left school, I stayed on and did my A-levels and didn't really know what I wanted to do as a career. Um, and then I was lucky enough to get a, a, a role with Salop Design and Engineering all 27 years ago now um, wow. as a press operator. And thoroughly enjoyed a, a different way of working, which was really not the education route didn't suit me um i'm quite a practical person i like to get involved uh and 28 well 27 years later this is my 28th year i'm still here uh, i've managed to do virtually every role within the company now as cco we rebranded the company in 2019 from salop design and engineering to sd technology looking to bring in new products, new processes, very much on the light waiting agenda. And yeah, I've had a fantastic career and look forward to another 27 years. Now, interesting, before we go into the detail, you, you, you changed the name to technology yeah. is, is, and you took away the word engineering. Is, is, that, is that because of the perception of manufacturing? Not really, no. I mean, engineering and manufacturing go hand in hand, but SDE technology, we're now looking to bring in a new process. We've got a first UK license for a hot form aluminium process, HFQ, and that's really going to set us apart from our competitors. So we are now cold and hot form pressings, fabrications, welding, powder coating. So we've really changed the company since about 2012 where we were predominantly just cold form press work. Now we're lots of different processes and looking to the future. Interesting, just, it's just use of the word technology and it's just what perception means, but that, that's, no. this makes total sense. Um, so, so, so back to the premise of looking at the UK, uh, we talk about having a balanced economy. We talk about having balanced economy in terms of how people are included economically. Uh, this country was famed, and we both know about the Industrial Revolution. It was famed for its innovation and particularly its manufacturing prowess. We saw the sector or the industry and sector diminish, particularly 80s and 90s, and now constitutes, I think, at best about 20% of GDP, something like that. Yep. So I suppose the argument might be, um, should we care about manufacturing? Why do you know, we shout about the lack of industrial strategy for manufacturing. Why does it matter? Why, do, why does manufacturing matter when clearly we make more money from other sectors? Well, if you look in the 80s and 90s, as you said, people turned their back on the manufacturing sector, certainly the government at that time. And they were looking to the service sector, the banking sector to, to hold up the economy. But without a manufacturing sector, without a strong manufacturing sector, those service and banking industries cannot hold up the economy. You look where we are now, it's only by having our own manufacturing. We need movers and makers in the UK. We need to be making our own product. 
we've relied too much on foreign, uh, either foreign investment or, uh, for example, the steel industry now. We can't make enough steel in the UK, so we have to import it. That means we are reliant too much on the rest of the world. We need to invest in the sector and have that 20%, that 30 40% at least. If, if I am, um, I'm going to take an article, so I'm just putting a newspaper for those who listen. Okay. Um, a chap called David Arnold, Chief Marketing Officer, Imagination Technologies. And they make, I think they design microchips. He says, um, Britain should focus on design, that was designing chips, rather than manufacturing them. It's not really what we're good at. We are very good at design and innovation and R&D, and we've got lots of companies that do that. We have a real solid community of companies supplying the global, and he's talking about semiconductor. Yeah. Is, is that a fair comment that maybe we're very good at innovation and design and maybe not so good at manufacturing, so why bother? No, that's, that's not fair. We're, we're good at all of it. The industrial revolution started here, which was us designing, coming up with the ideas, but then making those into product and actually selling the product. So I think manufacturing has got a, a bad press over since the 80s, 90s. There's some fantastic companies within, certainly within the West Midlands Combined Authority, but with, throughout the UK, there's some fantastic innovation and actual manufacturers, people making things. That's what we need to get better at. And that's how you drive the economy. And I think, Chris, people also forget the entire supply chain. They forget that. So if we take Jaguar Land Rover, the supply chain that they use, yes. arguably has more jobs than even at Jaguar Land Rover. So that is the supply chain. Um, and, and what else sort of benefits do you think of manufacturing? Is it one of pride knowing that we can buy our own products? And I mean, the classic example, uh, certainly when it sort of came prominent in my uh, sort of mind was when we had the debacle over PPE. We had major problem around masks. Um, we've just spoken about chips. Uh, so Jaguar Land Rover are struggling with their production, not because uh, they can't get the industrial relations right, far from it, it's the, the chips that go inside the cars. And then of course this country and basically the globe came to a halt with the Suez Canal, if you remember. Yes. So do, you, so do you think that's the case? Do you, do you think that's part of the case for onshoring and and, and increasing our, our capacity of manufacturing. Absolutely. And if you look to some of the companies who did fantastic work by switching their production very quickly to making PPE, that, that sums up the UK manufacturing sector. Certainly the, the lower tiers, second, third and fourth tier down into Jaguar Land Rover, are very responsive, willing to invest. Innovators can bring things to market very quickly and the Suez Canal crisis and the chip shortage just show that we are too much reliant on overseas product coming into this country. We haven't invested enough in the manufacturing sector. We need to now look at reshoring. There's issues with that, but the more we can make our own product and support our own supply chains, the better the UK economy will be. So Chris, we're now sitting here, both of us, actually agreeing, <laughs> arguing the case for manufacturing, yeah. So why does the rest of the country not agree with us? Is there a perception? Is there a lack of shouting from the manufacturers, a lack of leadership from manufacturers that we've not been able to translate what you and I are saying to the rest of the population? And in particular, probably you could argue number 10. Yeah, absolutely. And it is that perception within government that a UK manufacturing sector at 20% G GDP is okay. We don't need to invest. And it's only when you get a crisis like the Suez Canal, like COVID, like the chip shortage, that the politicians actually sit up and take notice. But there's nobody in government who's actually responsible for manufacturing. Nobody puts their head above the parapet and says, we need more investment, whether it's in the steel industry, and, and that's the real problem. The industrial strategy has been scrapped. There's no roadmap. And the government are just so focused on COVID. Now they need to put their heads above the parapet and actually look forward and say, we need an industrial strategy that helps UK manufacturers invest. And only with investment will we get the manufacturing sector back to where it should be. 
could it be partly, Chris, that to get into government, you either need to be a lawyer, you either need to be a financier, and that very few, if any, and I'm, you know, I'm desperate trying to think now, of a if manufacturer any, who got into politics. No, nope, I'm trying to think now. I don't think there's any, and a lot of them are unfortunately career politicians who don't know and don't thrive and support business. And that, that's the real issue. We need somebody in government who's going to pick it up and say, the UK manufacturing sector, with some investment and some clear roadmap for the industrial strategy, the sector can fly again. So picking up, um, before we, we pick up the industrial strategy, but yeah. back to perception again. Yes. Um, so we have an issue that uh, at the high end, top end, government doesn't understand the role of manufacturing or the importance of it. But you think there's something going wrong right at the start of a child's school career that nobody in schools or colleges or universities either talk about manufacturing, either talk about the importance of manufacturing, and in fact, never talk about manufacturing as a career. I know you did, you went in, yep. you enjoyed it. But is that part of the problem? Is part of the problem that in the media or and, and anywhere you look at, you've either got to be a lawyer, a financier, investment banker, and nobody ever says manufacturing. Is that part of the problem why, I mean, I I'm trying to think of how many startups we have as a percentage of manufacturers, but is, is schools the problem? It's that link between education and manufacturing companies, which has never been allowed to grow Schools are, are very wary of engaging with business. Business doesn't have a lot of time to engage with the schools and the colleges, unless you look at some very good businesses who actually push themselves out there. But manufacturing as a career is, is not pushed in schools. And business in general is not talked about in schools. So it's not just the STEM subjects. It's actually talking about business, talking about having to earn a wage when you leave school. But the mainstream media don't help. They are the first ones to say that manufacturing is on, on the uppers now. We're, we're struggling, the shortages, material shortages. And all that does is create a bad atmosphere around manufacturing when there's actually lots of investment going on in the UK, lots of job creation, lots of innovation. That's what we need to be promoting. If you're seeing bad news about a sector all the time in the mainstream media, why would you want your children to go into that sector? Uh, I think two of the things um, that I noticed is that and I'm, I'm going back a bit. Um, I don't remember at school anybody ever saying to me, uh, you know, manufacturing's the place to go. Uh, our perception of manufacturing was uh, dirty, uh, was big factories, yep. belling out a lot of smoke. Um, the perception you could get a job in manufacturing with no skill set. In other words, listen, you could just walk into a foundry because all you really need is a bit of brawn, not yeah. brain. Um, I think our parents who spent, well, certainly my father, um, at the coal face, they would say, steel industry, found it difficult. It was hard work. And I think all those things didn't help. And I think, interestingly, they, cheat, they teach or they used to teach uh, manufacturing lean production and things, but nobody ever applied it and said, uh, this is what works in manufacturing. And I think the bit that gets me, manufacturing, I think, of all the sectors, is the one when it scales, and I mean properly scales, produces the most jobs. Yes. And, and, and I think that's the bit, I think part of the jigsaw no one seems to uh, pick up. Okay, so, so you, we agree, schools need to be educated on the merits, I think of. And what, what can business do to make that, that relationship better? Well, lots of businesses I know, certainly in the Midlands, put themselves out there and connect with schools, but you need to find the right school with the right teacher. Uh, it's not certainly not education's fault. They're under tremendous pressure to ingrain the core sort of skills and core lessons and they don't always have time to engage with business. The first thing that gets cut from a, an education budget is normally the careers teacher. So they're, they're under tremendous pressure. It's really that link. So we do a lot of SD technology. Over the last four or five years, we've had school visits. We bring people in. 
And I say to the careers teachers, look, if we bring 10 kids into this factory and nine of them don't like it, they'll try harder at school. But the one person who does like it will look for a job in manufacturing. But all 10 of those kids will have got something positive from that experience. And that's what we need to do more of. Now, in the current climate, we could do a lot more with video content. So I'm working with Factory Now who do a lot of video content that can be taken into schools to show people what manufacturing is. And when you say it's the, the dirty big factories, it's not that anymore. We're looking for That's character right. designers. We're looking for team leaders. We're looking for robotic experts. We're looking for people now to take us to the next level of our automation. So it's really changing that perception. And we need government also to be changing this perception and pushing manufacturing as a career choice, not something that you do when you can't do anything else. And interestingly, it's... They, they can be very well-paid jobs in manufacturing, very well-paid. Absolutely, absolutely, and a long-term career. So if you look where I've been here 26, seven years now, we're, we're investing in the future. Um, Richard Homden, the CEO, is looking to the next level of people coming in. What can we do? We want skills, and we want, we want people who come in and want to work with the company. So the apprenticeship route would be a great way in because that allows you to see the company, make sure you're the right fit, but also you're getting trained all the way through and you end up with a loan-free degree at the end of it. So it's a sensible choice. Uh, you, you and I both bemoaned the lack of an industrial strategy, which sort of implies yeah. the whole thing about skills and everything. Um, and, and, and I remember challenging uh, the business secretary at the time about the removal of mass, which is the manufacturing advisory service. And for those who don't know, um, they were assisting people in manufacturing on how to improve whatever they were doing. So it was an advisory service, uh, but they were reaching out to manufacturers, particularly smaller ones, who probably could do with some help. And they got rid of that. Um, and, and we thought, certainly for those in the black country where you know manufacturing is so key, we, we thought that was a, a really, really big mistake. So why do people like you bemoan that we used to have an industrial strategy that was hadn't been quite signed off? But no. we, it was nearly that. We all spent a lot of lot of time. A lot of time. So 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 why did you think it was uh, okay? I mean, I I asked the former business secretary of state, um, was it a mistake, or was it flawed from the start? So was it a mistake to drop it, or was it, or was it flawed? Was it never going to do anything? Well, I think it, it certainly it was 2017 and there was a lot of promotion around it. I fed in through, personally, I fed into the, the government website. I fed in through the local council. I fed in through the LEP, fed in through Shropshire Chamber. So I spent lots of time and effort because I thought the 10 pillars actually gave us a fighting chance of having a long-term strategy, not this cyclical where the governments come and go, you need something that's all party bought into and is long term, similar to what they have in Germany. And that is the only way that companies can invest. If we don't know the roadmap, how can we invest in the right equipment? So we need to know whether they're going all electric or whether it's hydrogen. But at least by having an industrial strategy, a starting point, you can then change that with minor steps along the way. Now we simply have nothing. So we don't know what the government plan to invest in, what's the new technology, and a lot of the investment we plan is paid back over five, ten years. It's a long-term investment. We can't be taking a chance on what we think the government are going to do next. And all businesses like that, business is willing to invest as long as they know they're investing in the right piece of equipment that gives the right payback, or the right skill set that gives the right payback. But without an industrial strategy, you can't do anything. And what what annoys me, there doesn't seem to be anything to replace it yet. If you're going to scrap something, have a, have a plan B. Don't scrap it and say, we'll get to it later in the day or later in the year, because that, that's not helping investment. But what about those who argue the private sector should be left alone and get on with it? We as a government shouldn't get involved. But they have we to could... get involved. They have to get involved at some stage even if they're involving business and they're having the discussions and not just discussions with the OEMs, the Jaguars, the Nissans of this world, but smaller businesses. 90% 90, 90 of the businesses in the UK are SMEs 
And that is where investment, innovation and manufacturing is, is coming from. And you need to engage with SMEs further down the supply chain. In, in terms of a strategy then for the UK, um, you supply automotive, yes? Yeah, yes, automotive, white goods, yellow goods, yeah. yeah. So if we take now the move towards electrification, the move towards um, what Tesla set the set the whole thing going. Yeah. Uh, well, quite a few did. Um, so that means now battery powered cars. Um, they're building some uh, factories to build uh, the, the batteries. So this seems to be a hint of an industrial strategy or an implied one that was sort of picking yes. up, and that may be actually be driven by market forces rather than government. Yeah. Or the government has made a, a 2030 commitment. So in terms of automotive then, um, and in terms of batteries, what does that imply now for manufacturing? What, what, what does the people in the supply chain start up to think now? What, what's the implication? How, how, do, how do manufacturers, particularly in the automotive, have to start rethinking? How, how does it impact on you? Well, we have to rethink everything we do. So in 2004 we were supplying exhaust systems exhaust boxes into rover and into bmw there won't be exhaust systems not when you're all electric there are on hybrids but things like fuel rails all these the, all these products now will become obsolete so what we need to do now is start thinking of light weighting new technologies you think of a battery in a car is much heavier than a, a petrol or a diesel engine so the cars themselves have become heavier and now what you need to do to get the range extension on the batteries, you need to make every other component lighter than it was. So it's going to drive innovation right through the supply chain. And that innovation is what the UK manufacturing sector is really good at. That's where we need to get back to our industrial strategy routes and actually work with the government now and see what more we need to do, whether it's R&D, whether it's investment, whatever it is, we need, to, we need to grasp it now and try and get ahead of the rest of the world and get back to a fantastic UK manufacturing sector. How does that impact on skills? What we need now is, is new skills. So we need people who can actually think outside the box. We need CAD designers. We need, we need lots of different skills. And these skills need to be taught in the schools now so in three, four years time, those people coming through have the skills ready. So they need to change the way they're talking about manufacturing in schools, talk about light weighting, electrification, hydrogen is another one because there's still, there's still investment in hydrogen. So there's lots of other things. And in 10 years time, there'll be, there'll be new things that we're talking about. You and I will be sat here talking about completely new technologies and different ways of manufacturing whether that's small factories, um, you look at Arival, and they've got a completely different model than most businesses. So there's some fantastic investment going on in the UK with the Gigafactories and Nissan, and it's exciting. But we need to talk about these exciting changes all the time within schools, education, and manufacturing. You talked about technologies, um, AI, artificial intelligence, robotics. Yep. yep. Uh, the internet, uh, 5G, this could place manufacturing, actually, you could actually reposition manufacturing and actually virtually call every manufacturing business a technology business, hence your name, name change. Um, and if that's the case, we are really talking a totally different set of skills from the ones that I pictured earlier about yeah. foundries and not needing skills and if you didn't have if you had a poor education you could always go and work in the factory I mean, we're talking about something totally different here now with robotics ai and 5g we are but don't forget the youngsters of today are brought up with these technologies so when i was young there were no mobile phones there was no internet yeah. but they're brought up with this and the fact that you can have robots working in your company doesn't mean you need less workers what it means is you get leaner you get slicker you actually bring in more work and you need more workers. And things like cobots, so collaborative robots working with operators on the shop floor. I mean, these are really exciting changes and you've got to embrace change. If you don't embrace change, embrace change you stand still and you go backwards. 
So everyone needs to look to the future. And I think it's, it's a fantastic, exciting time. That means the person of tomorrow is going to be more of a digital person yes, than absolutely. what we used to do was with brawn and strength. This is, this is somebody who's got a, a really good education, understands digital yep. and complexity and how to handle complexity and innovation, actually. Absolutely. And it's going to be all about data. Um, it's going to be data driven. People can work remotely. So the factory of the future will change dramatically. There's still going to be some processes which are hands-on processes, but they will be few and far between if you look 10, 20 years ahead. And what we need to do now is invest in the automation, in the skills, and actually make sure that we've got the workforce of the future coming through. So really, if, um, if you struggled at school or you didn't get the education, a factory may not be the right place for you anymore because the factory will require people with high um, understanding of data, uh, highly skilled in digital and creative problem solving. It will, but there's always the opportunity for someone who doesn't fit in that education route. Manufacturing is, is also still, and engineering will always be, more about hands-on and someone thinking in a different way. So in the 80s, 90s, everyone was pushed into the university route. That didn't suit a lot of people. Now we're looking more at the apprenticeship route, the Kickstarter route, just to get people into business and see if they're a good fit. So there's always going to be a role for people who are willing to learn, enthusiastic, and maybe learn in a different way. So I don't learn by reading a book. I learn by physically doing an action, getting involved, speaking to other people. Um, so that there's a role for everyone within manufacturing. And actually, while you chat, while you're speaking, around, let me just ask you a question. I never thought I was going to ask you, but I might as well ask you now. Is so, if someone comes to the front door, you've just said perhaps the CV is not that important. Yep. Uh, what do you look for then for somebody to work in manufacturing? When somebody walks through the door and says, "I need a job," enthusiasm, enthusiasm, and someone who will turn up on time, think that having a job is important but somebody who thinks in a different way. So we're not looking for the same person to come in every single day. We're looking for that variety and it's that variety of people. Um, so the CEO here is an engineer. I'm not an engineer, but I've been in engineering for 27 years. I'm commercial sales, now doing the ops role as well. And we all have something different to bring. And that's what's really good about business. You can have lots of different characters but you put them all together and it becomes a really successful company. We've talked about a, a, a global marketplace and, and the fact that we can scale. Um, but of course, this government has decided by 2030 net zero. Uh, we've got China, Venezuela, India and the US. Um, horrendous pollution, horrendous um, commitment, not, not very good commitment to energy at all. Uh, so when you look at the UK, um, and we're pushing for net zero, does that put us commercially at a major disadvantage? And should we be, as a country, be leading when most of the largest countries are not adhering to it at all? And I've just given you four of them. It's a difficult choice because we can't, we can't turn our back on the fact that global warming is a reality. And we are all adding to that, but we are on the commercial back foot because others aren't playing on the same playing field as us. And it's, it's always been the way, whether you look at health and safety, whether you look at energy costs, we, we always try and do the very best for our country and the globe. And yet commercially, we're, we're the ones who pay the penalties, unfortunately. And it makes business very hard. But I think what you'll see now with the, the push for onshoring is the fact we can't be reliant on other companies, other countries, because when there is a, a shortage, our supply chains stop and we can't build cars, washing machines, whatever it is. So it's affecting our production. So we need to keep going the way we are. And hopefully the likes of America will see sense and start playing their part. China, I think, is, is further behind. Talking about um, just unshoring and, and the whole commercial side, um, do we have the infrastructure and the skills 
and the investment to onshore or to increase onshoring rather? Currently in some areas, yes. Um, but if you look at chip manufacturing, that, that takes massive investment. If you look at the gigafactories for batteries, that takes investment and it takes a time scale as well. And skills will become the biggest issue again. It's always been bubbling under uh, the skills issue and it never really gets fixed. The apprenticeship route, when that was rolled out a few years ago, that was meant to fix the problems. But uh, the apprenticeship route itself has been changed. Uh, the apprenticeship levy was, was rolled out and still doesn't help most companies. So that skills gap is, is only going to get greater. Um, so they need to look at that as the starting point. But really onshoring, everyone should be looking at what they're having to import and try and find a company. So through Bayes, whoever it is, the local chambers, can we be making more product in the UK? And at least we should be looking, are we competitive enough? And if we're not, then we have to put more investment in. It's been a um, difficult 18 months. Tell me, how, how did you cope the last 18 months? So it's been very tough. So from the end of March last year, um, when the lockdown sort of came into play, that very first week of April 2020, we were, as a company, shut down. Myself and the other two directors were working from home. Um, but very quickly, our customers asked us to start opening up again because we supplied some um, needed product. So we brought, I think at one point we had six people within the company. We're normally, we're back to 100 now. And it was really between April and end of July, the, the order book kept going up very slightly, but in April it was 10% of our normal sales. So we had to do some restructuring, unfortunately. Uh, so it was a very tough time. It was as bad as sort of 2008, 2009, the recession, when, when again, we had to make some tough decisions. But from September onwards, the order book has come back. Um, March this year, we had a record order book in terms of sales, the best for 17 years. Wow. People, are now, people are now spending. People, whether they, whether they think life is too short, uh, but if you look at Rolls-Royce having, having a record year, Lamborghini having a record year, people are out there spending. Now, how long that will continue? We don't know. But I think there is a real push now to buying British, supporting the UK manufacturing sector and supporting the jobs within it. You just said uh, uh, buying British products. Yeah. I think too often we forget what a strong brand the UK is Absolutely. abroad. And, and maybe we're not exploiting the full potential of that brand by not exporting more of our products, if that sort of makes sense. So exporting financial services is great, but it's not something you can get hold of and no. say, well, that's British. Yeah. Um, and, and, and maybe that's, and, and maybe that's really right. Where is the, the government recognize that and then put some, some sort of thought behind the brand, the UK brand abroad, how can be exploited through manufacturing. Yeah. Um, and, and, and while we're talking about that around the, around the brand, do you think we make good marketers and manufacturing and manufacturers, or do you think it needs more people commercially savvy like yourself? Because that's something that has been charged against UK manufacturing, that we don't export as much as we should, and we don't really promote and sort of increase our branding abroad. Do, do you think that's a weakness for manufacturers, branding and marketing? I think we're a lot better than we used to be. Um, I still think there is more to do. But I think also over this, this last 18 months, people now look at online and look at digital and look at their social media. And I think people are getting better and better at that. But that, again, is bringing skills in. So the younger generation uh, have that knowledge, can do the social media, can do the websites. And the more people we bring into our business to diversify our business makes us look forward but I think if we had for example a minister for manufacturing their job would be to promote brand UK and to actually sell to the rest of the world yes we need to do trade deals 
Um, we don't want to turn our back on anyone around the world, including Europe. But what we need to do is have more manufacturing in the UK, because that is the only thing that really drives a strong economy. What does the future look like, both for your business and for manufacturing, you think, having taken into account 5G, AI, robotics, and what does the future look like? Where do you think we'll be in 10 years' time when it comes to manufacturing? I think we'll have a much stronger manufacturing sector. I think we'll have some great British brands. I think there'll be further investment with more gigafactories. I think there'll be more investment in robotics and automation. But I think it's a really exciting time to get into manufacturing now when we see the, you'd call it the next industrial revolution. This real step to 5G to data driven manufacturing is a fantastic time to get into manufacturing. I mean, I'm, I've been here 27 years now and I've seen the change within not just our company, but companies within the Midlands area uh, and around the UK. But really the, the, the Midlands area, this this West Midlands Combined Authority, if you look at Coventry with Jaguar Land Rover, uh, the Midlands Engine, so to speak, there's so much innovation happening all the time that it can only get stronger. So I see it getting stronger, more investment, more job creation, and those jobs will be really exciting jobs. I started with the word balanced economy. And I think a strong manufacturing base gives you that balanced economy. I think, it give, I think it gives you scale. And I think the skills that we used to think about um, th that were required for manufacturing, I think will change. You're absolutely right. I think we'll be looking for, I like, I like the words you said, enthusiastic, looking to learn. We're looking for people with transferable skills. And in fact, if you go and work for manufacturing, you can go into finance, you can go into operations. Yeah. I think going forward, we're probably going to be talking technology. We're going to be talking digital. I can't think of somewhere with that much variety than in manufacturing, to be honest. And it's and it's yeah. it's. I think I think you're absolutely right, Chris. I think the the future looks great, provided we get the bigger macro picture correct and we get the support from the government. Um, Chris, I'm going to go and have a cup of tea now. This has been fantastic. I knew I'd get lots of pearls of wisdom. <laughs> and, and nuggets from you um, and, and, and really I think I, I think it's fantastic I think we're privileged to have a manufacturing industry and, and fingers crossed um, if what Covid has taught us is that we need more of it and, and whilst the ex-business Secretary of State uh, Greg Clark said we can't be isolationists we need to trade with the world I think we should be trading more with the world and with more British products with a fantastic brand because everybody loves the UK and its products. Absolutely. And with those British brands, that British product is built on an engineering and manufacturing background from the industrial strategy. We're still making great British products, which is a sign of quality. So I've been here 27 years and I will come back on the show in 27 years time, Linda. <laughs> and, 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 and with commitment like that, UK PLC can only go in one direction, which is northwards. Chris, thanks very much for your time. Fantastic. Thank you, Ninda, and we'll catch you up soon.